Good evening. I'm Terry Thornton. I'm Curator of Education here at The Modern. And it's my enormous pleasure to welcome you to Tuesday Evenings at The Modern. Um, Tuesday Evenings, as I think many of you know, is a weekly lecture series. Um, for this season, it began in February, and it has been an interesting run with um, a varied array of talented artists. We've had, I believe, all artists this, this round, um, all speaking on their work and enlightening us in numerous ways about the work and beyond. Um, sadly, I have to report that Thomas DeMond, who was scheduled for a special May 17th Tuesday evening, um, in conjunction with the museum's Focus Thomas DeMann exhibition, has had to cancel due to the very recent birth of his son, who happens to be named August, which is the name of my son, so all is forgiven. <laughs> um, of course, um, the birth of his son is good news, in fact, and it's a very, it's very understandable reason for him to want to stay close to home. So we have, however, discussed um, Damon returning for uh, the fall Tuesday evening lecture um, season. And in the meantime, we have um, the great pleasure of his work um, as the Focus exhibition opens on April 30th. Um, Damon's cancellation makes tonight's presentation our finale for spring 2016, and quite honestly, I think um, it is a very beautiful way to go out. Um, last week, some of you were here for a conversation between artist uh, Frank Stella and the Modern's curator, Michael Opping, as we opened Frank Stella, uh, retro a retrospective. Um, while there is no real relation between Stella and tonight's guest, the artist Martha Tuttle, they do both work within and challenge the language of painting. Stella is 80 years of age, um, who is 80 years of age, is late in his career, while Martha Tuttle, having received her MFA from Yale School of Art in 2015, is launching hers. That and Stella being male and Tuttle being female are, is probably where the comparisons end, but I was thrilled when I came across Martha's um, solo exhibition, Martha T Tuttle, May 2, at uh, Tilton Gallery in New York in January after having um, seen Frank Stella at the Whitney where it opened last fall. And I'm sure the proximity of my experiencing um, each set up my interest in their similarities and differences. Um, while very much of this moment there is something ancient about Martha Tuttle's work, and yet something completely refreshing and new um, in her careful attentiveness and material consciousness, um, which makes sense, um, may too, something between. Um, Martha Tuttle was born in Santa Fe, New Mexico to poet Meme uh, Bersenbrugge and um, artist Richard Tuttle and was raised predominantly in New York where she currently lives and works. Before her MFA from Yale, Martha graduated from Bard College in 2011, which she followed with a few residencies, as well as receiving a Joseph Albers Foundation Traveling Fellowship and in 2014, a Donald C. Gallup um, Research Fellowship from the Abenaki Rare Books and Manuscripts Library of Yale University. Martha's work has been included in group exhibitions throughout the US and Europe. Her solo exhibition at Tilton Gallery was met by praise with um, David Ebony, describing it as understated and graceful in his top 10 New York Gallery shows this winter. Um, and Kate Monroe's review for Artnet News um, reporting while mass production and digitization continue to dominate the contemporary art conversation, 26-year-old Martha Tuttle is doing something refreshingly measured and um, tactile. We are fortunate to have Martha here tonight to close Tuesday evenings for us and to enlighten us on her work and thoughts as I am sure we are witnessing something special, new and enduring in tonight's presentation. Please join me in welcoming Martha Tuttle. Thanks, Terry. Um, it is 
Very great to be here. Uh, I was saying earlier that as soon as I feel like I get off the plane in the West, like it feels really like home. So <laughs> thank you for having me. Um, and it's, it's such an honor to be invited here, especially after hearing about the previous lectures and the other artists, and a lot of whom I, I think of as my teachers or um, I've learned a lot from. And so I was just thinking, like, what is it that I have to offer? And I think that's that I can tell you what it's like to, to feel like I'm beginning um, and that I'm in this moment in which I'm um, proposing a work and starting to shape a cosmology. And I don't know yet where that will go or, or whether it will be the one that I'll, I'll have for the rest of my, my life in art, but I think that, that that beginning moment is kind of a special one too. Um, the very least, I think, very hard on all the stuff that I don't know about. Um, so I wrote a piece that I'd like to share with you tonight, um, but I'd also love the opportunity to show you some of my work. So I think what I'm going to do is uh, read for a little bit, and then take a break and show you some slides, and then finish up by a little more reading. In full disclosure, I've never really been able to understand what happened during the Big Bang. It, and I should also mention that this, this talk comes out of um, my questions around material, matter, and process with my work. It's strange to me that something as tangible as temperature could exist without physical matter. And I cannot conceptualize how a moment of beginning can exist outside of time. Probably, like many things that hold my attention, I get just enough to grasp how little I know, which is, a little before that which I know as time and that which I know as space began, there was something like matter or perhaps an ancestor to it. Through chance or through grace, a reaction happened in something that existed but had no size, and in a moment that had no time, all that we have been, all that we are now, and all we will ever be emerged. In that single reaction, in unimaginably small particles, I was there, and so were you, as was everyone we will ever know or learn about. The story of matter is in its core a story of relation. Most simply, I'm interested in thinking about matter because I would like to feel a sense of belonging to my world. I would like not only to conceptualize, but actually feel in my literal and mineral bones that what I am is matter in a world of matter. Despite my consciousness, my position in this world is as a collaborator with it, the isness, the elemental. Not a particle in the flow of being, but the flow. A few weeks ago, I went to the Museum of Natural History in New York to look at what are called chondrites, or colloquially, space dust. These small, so-called primitive meteors, composed of elements present when our solar system formed, were never large enough to be subject to adaptative forces such as melting. In these modest fragments, we gain access not only to our age, but also to our very basic composition. I should mention that we have jumped, give or take, about 10 billion years from where we began. The story of our origin is not simple, nor is it short. It might be more apt to say that what I'm actually trying to understand is less a point of origin as much as a state of continuous becoming. But why does my heart beat so fast when I gaze at these little gray and round particles of space dust held in the most unassuming of stones? Because I can hold in my hands that which has traveled so far, that which has witnessed an impression and a history of space that my consciousness never will, but I believe tells me how I'm able to exist in my body. The fascinating field of epigenetics reveals that memories can be passed down through generations. How far can this cellular recall go?
And I get so emotional because how wonderful that the secrets of our becoming are held in such a seemingly humble form. Holding the universe in a grain of sand, we are the universe thinking about itself, or we are walking, talking minerals. It would be so easy to dismiss these as apparent sentimentalities, rather than to acknowledge how amazing it is that they are not at all poetic exaggerations, just a simple statement of fact. That which we hold, that which we are, reverberates outwards into solar systems and supernovas. These chondrites which have experienced a level of time and of space that my consciousness cannot even begin to conceive of are actually that which I am also. If we are trying to say things frankly, the origin is inseparable from me. And isn't it even more spectacular that this isn't really anything to write home about? Just the weather, just the being. You might be wondering at this point, why is this relevant? Why am I talking about space? And why is any of this an art question? Or maybe it is an art question in as much as when we are talking about our origin, we are talking about everything. But how can discussion about such ungraspable vastness lend any clarity to a dialogue around contemporary material and process? I suppose because wanting to tell you about why I care about material or physical matter is a little bit like telling you why I make art. It's such a big question, and it starts before I do. I feel both boundless, like I could rope in any tangential subject, and muted, like nothing I could tell you will ever really communicate the emotional resonance thinking about making work within our mattered world has for me. Like looking for ghosts or into the sky for distant solar systems, I so often have nothing to give you other than the poetic, because this is a subject I have only to this point been able to see in my peripheral vision. And I need to tell you about my outward attempts to understand what it means to be matter in a world of matter, because although I have great respect and interest in the history of material and art, I make more out of a need to create a cosmology of connectivity than to work with an established critical dialogue. Better said, a few artists that I look at frequently are Marissa Mertz, Leonardo Drew, Judy Pfaff, Ellen Atsui, David Hammonds, Robert Smithson, and Dorothea Rockburn. But I don't think about them any more than I do the pink splotches that emerged by happenstance on a 17th century Korean moon jar or the way a piece of Egyptian linen unravels like lace, or about an aerial photograph of gray waves crashing onto a black sand beach somewhere north, or what it would feel like to hold a piece of rock from space in my hands. Have you ever been looking at something beautiful and had such a strong desire of longing you experienced a desire to gaze upon it while you were already doing so? or been on top of a mountain looking outwards and been struck with such a profound sense of grief because your conscious senses are not adequately developed to absorb the landscape at the level that you wish to. There's a painting by Jasper Johns at the MoMA called Man Bites Painting. It is, as you might figure, a small gray panel covered in encaustic with a bite taken out of the metal. It's a funny painting, but I don't think of it as an off-the-cuff piece or really even a joke. To me, it's a quite literal depiction of an experience one can have. To love or hate so much, to be moved so deeply, that the only seemingly logical way to achieve experience is consumption. To literally put that which you gaze upon in digestible collaboration with one's own body. Clarice Lispector does this with her cockroach in The Passion According to G.H. The 12th century German mystic Hildegard von Bingen talks about melting into a cloud. At times, physical touch can seem not enough, and we are overcome with the desire to eat, to become, to commingle, either on a molecular or cosmic level, that which moves us. Could this desire for dissolution be a memory of time before human consciousness conceived of borders? 
I remember being six or seven and becoming so devastated when a friend told me that a thin layer of atoms are ever present between the boundary of my body and everything that I touch. That despite having perceptions of the tangible, I had never actually reached my mother's hand, a flower, or the clay marbles I carried everywhere in my pocket. I'm thinking now that it was the perception of difference in the first place that should be held to a higher level of scrutiny. I see my own work with material as a quieter, even quotidian version of reacting to a desire to bridge the distinction between my form and that which is commonly labeled inanimate. Although continuous touch is important to me, the labor I go through becomes most practically a method of asking my consciousness to step aside for alternative communications or non-auditory dialogues. Can I touch something with an awareness of how it feels on a cellular level? Does this awareness make any bit of difference? If my focus wanders, if my conscious mind takes over and I spend my studio day wondering about my taxes, whether or not I left the stove on, and what the weather will be like on Friday, will the painting I'm working on change in feeling when you receive it? I should say, however, that it's not so important that it's my body that experiences dissolution in my work, rather the possibility of a body. My body is just the one I have access to. As I mentioned to you in the beginning of the talk, the thing that's the most important to me in my work is figuring out how I can feel a sense of belonging to my world. I'm trying to immerse myself in an understanding that the world is made up of matter and so am I. I'll say that again. My instincts say that both touch and labor, which is time, are the most valuable tools I possess if I want to pursue the collapse of boundaries between my body and the surrounding forms. Is this elaborated intimacy? I engage with the world, yes, but it also leaves its mark on me. So with these questions, um, thinking about belonging and thinking about um, if it's possible or, or even as a thought experiment to transcend uh, a feeling of what it's like to be in a, a physical body with the physical world. I think um, I'd like to turn to my work. And the images I'm going to show you, as Terry said, um, are, are, are all from this show uh, in February that ended in February called Metaxu, which is from, uh, it's a Greek word, but I took it from uh, Simone Weil in her book, Gravity and Grace, uh, and it means the space in between. Um, I, was, I was kind of on the fence about whether I would show you images from grad school or not. Um, and in the end, I decided not to, because that, it was such a special experience for trying things out that a lot of the work I felt like was um, the luxury of using someone else's idea and not mine. And because it is a pressure cooker when I had the opportunity to make the work for the show, it really forced me to think about what I care about, what's important to me, um, if there is such a thing, what my work is at its core. And I, and I would argue there is. My mom makes fun of me because she says, like, everything you do looks like when you were three years old making the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> So this is a piece called Grasses. Um, and what it is, it's a wool panel and then two layers of paper. And the wool is all hand spun and hand woven. Um, and then it's uh, dyed, this piece is dyed primarily with indigo, but also with clay and iron. Um, and then the piece is beaten over the, the course of several days. Um, so something that's important in my work is, as I do use textile practices, I find those um, to be the most tactile and the most that help me deal with these questions. 
of matter, uh, but I do see them within a painting language, or at least I, I feel like I learn from a painting language. Um, and, and one of the things I think about when I work on these surfaces is um, when you see a really, really beautiful Renaissance painting, a lot of the times it has a quality of light that is uh, not frequently found in work today. And um, that's for a lot of reasons, but the one that I'm the most interested in is uh, because pigments are hand ground, the molecules are, or the particles are uneven, so they're reflecting light in different ways throughout the, the paint. Um, and similarly with this, my choice to use uh, a lot of um, natural pigments and dyes has an, um, a tie to that quality of light or that interest in light. Um, and also the beading of the fabric allows the light to be different. So there's a, a luminosity in these pieces um, that I'm interested in. This is an overview of the space. Um, yeah, and like I said, uh, the pieces are hand spun and I use a drop spindle instead of a spinning wheel because it allows the, the string to be very uneven and at times you'll get something like a, a piece as thick as my thumb on top of a, a piece like spider silk. And uh, another question that's important to me is thinking about how a person, an artist, can collaborate with their material, which is probably what we're doing all the time. But hopefully in my work, if the terms can be simple enough, um, that question can, can come out more directly. Uh, and so the spinning does that. Um, it's, it's so, I don't know if any of you have, have spun wool before, but it, it, takes, it takes a while and um, my mind definitely goes away at points, and that's what I'm really interested in. And I, I think at that time, then the material takes charge. Um, and then, so these are all dyed with logwood. Uh, and then the change in color is just, uh, the fabric is mordanted in different places. Uh, so it's just reacting to different metals um, in the mordants. Uh, and this is from a series called Cold Water. Um, and historically, I see these pieces maybe in um, line with a lot of, of work with Frank Stella, I think is a great example. Uh, Agnes Martin is another one. Um, but I think uh, what I think about maybe more in terms of these is shadows, uh, the lines that are found in shadows. Um, this is a, from a site in uh, the coast of Peru called Corral, which is the second oldest civilization after Mesopotamia. And this is something called a calendar stone. So it stretches up um, and then depending on the length of the shadow um, and where it is along the circle, a person can tell the date of the year and the time. And I have always thought that being able to watch the way that a shadow line can engage with topography to be a particular way of seeing uh, drawings form in the landscape. And so when I was making these pieces and allowing the, the, the spun wool to do what it wanted, I think that this image was perhaps the most on my mind. It's another installation shot. This is a piece called Flowers and um, these are two drawings from a series called the Rupture Drawing Series. Uh, this is similar to the grasses, um, and, but it, it's, its title is Flowers. Um, so it had the same process of being beaten in the front, which creates the quality of light. Uh, I wanted to say something about uh, where I get my pigments from. Um, most of them are gathered from New Mexico where I grew up and I think that there's a, a geographical specificity that's interesting to me in this um, because I gather them and because I prepare them, they have an impurity um, when the color is never exactly perfect. Uh, and then when I look at a piece like this, I can tell you 
that that clay I got from the the north side of a of a hill outside where my mother lives, and I'm never sure if that resonates directly, but I, I do think that um, it affects how I, I treat the work. And so creating this space of connection with the material to me is premium. And having that closeness, both geographical and um, biographical, I think is a, is a tool. Um, the other thing that I mentioned, wanted to mention was for me, because my body is so involved in these, these, this practice that um, using the non-toxic materials becomes important uh, because I think I, I can allow myself uh, to get to a pretty deep place of connection and um, be um, ankle deep in dye and in uh, these big pieces especially because they're bigger than, than my frame is able to handle. So... Uh, I'm always on top of them and dragging them around. And um, I think that I know that they won't harm me uh, creates a difference in how I, I treat the work. Um, again, these are, these are uh, from a series called The Rupture Drawings. Um, what they are is their paper uh, sanded on the wall and where the ruptures form is where there's a maybe a micro difference um, in a wall that's been repainted and maybe there's a stud. So I don't plan for them, but I don't prevent them. Uh, and the sanding is done over such a long time and is, is done pretty delicately. So the ruptures form very slowly. Uh, and I think of them maybe more as unexpected moments of drying. So I, I was struck uh, last summer that I couldn't think of a word for um, a change like this that didn't start with a negative word like de degradation, decay. But really what this, this does, or anything that dissolves into the world, is just going into another state of being. Um, I guess transformation would be like almost there, but and I was really struck by this. I mean, maybe someone can think of a good word, but um, I wasn't able to, and so I wanted to make a, a series of work that addressed um, a breakdown that m didn't feel like it was going past its life, but in another state of becoming. And then for these, uh, that idea of collaborating with one's material also comes in. Um, the pigment is clay and uh, iron, and it's placed on the inside of the sanded surface, and then they're dyed from the outside with indigo. Uh, this is from a Japanese indigo plant, and that's from woad, which is, uh, indigo is a reaction, but um, in many different plants, but as you can see, the impurities create a totally different um, color. And with this question of what's a word for um, uh, this kind of transformation that doesn't imply decay, I've started to create this um, little visual journal of images that I really feel uh, maybe in some terms could be a lesser version of the thing itself, but that visually I find maybe even more beautiful, or the transformation is why I looked at them in the first place. Uh, this is an adobe wall with weather damage. This is a paper, cotton pulp, before being made into printmaking paper. And this is a window uh, covered in sediment. This is a series called um, Clear Sound. And uh, the bottom part is wool, and the wool is from different sheep, so it becomes, to me, more in a pigment language. And um, the way that it reflects light, the way that it uh, receives the, the physicality of the process uh, to which I subject it, um, it becomes, in, in a way, to me, like, again, looking at the Renaissance paintings and and thinking about pigment, although of course it's, it's completely different. Um, 
And then the top part is a, is a woven surface, um, which is a thin steel wrapped in silk, so it holds the memory of uh, my hand making it. Um, and then the, the color is from metal. So I think um, something I'm not sure if it's in the dialogue everywhere, but something that said, um, that I found at least in graduate school and um, something that's maybe in a lot of the, the galleries that I go to is this association with, um, or a negative association with delicacy. And the word precious is thrown around a lot. Um, and I, I, at first I was like, oh, I don't want to be precious. Like, oh, I'm tough. Um, and, but then I was like, well, the, the world's actually really precious. I mean, I know what people mean, and I know that um, it's easy to get too deep in a piece and fall in love with it too much and, and not, not feel like you can bring it to where it needs to go. But I, I just, I think that term became so fascinating um, because, yeah, again, the world is precious and I, I do... Uh, think that maybe what I have to say or maybe what I, I can develop that could be interesting is a language of care and attention. Um, and so, so in making this work, um, really just trying, even though it, at times it can be so um, almost embarrassing because cause it, it, it gets thrown around so much, trying not to run away from delicacy was, was um, very important to me. I also tried really hard to, to fall in love with these pieces while I was making them, um, because <laughs> uh, at one point someone told me, like, you have to hate your work if you want to make good work. And <laughs> I just thought, like, well, yeah, maybe. Like, maybe that works for someone. But the idea that like love can't be as intellectually sound as feeling like a worm all the time, like, that's crazy. So, um, so with these works, I, I, I tried seeing what it would be like, and it was uncomfortable, it was really uncomfortable, and I would do weird things, like like say hello to them when I came in, and like, like close to the end of the show, like where the, I was kind of going bonkers because I was spinning wool all day long, like I would kiss them goodbye. Um, so, but, but again, back to the delicacy thing, one of the things that I like about the steel wrapped in silk is, is it looks so uh, ephemeral and like it could flow right away in an instant, but it's actually a sheet of metal. Um, the bottom layer of that is uh, from churro sheep, which it, again is the same relationship to material. It's, um, it looks soft there, but the, the sheep were brought over by the uh, Spanish and New Mexico and probably here too, um, and they can eat anything. Um, I really like going to sheep and wool festivals. That top is, is colored with iron. Um, this is another overview of the cold water and then a piece called Pines and Plovers. And this is a piece called Pines and Plovers. Um, so Borges has these really wonderful lectures um, at Harvard, they're recorded, uh, and I, I like to listen to them a lot. But one of the things that he said was so striking was that um, he said, well, when people ask me to talk about my work, I, I just wish that they um, would, would ask me to tell them about an artist I loved because that, that's an easier thing for me to, to express what I care about than my own work. So um, kind of an homage to that idea. I just wanted to show you a couple images of what I've been looking at. Um, this is that moon jar. It's, um, it's beautiful, but those pink marks were unexpected. Um, they happen just in the firing process, but they feel so perfect. Like, I, I can't imagine anything better than that. And whether we're talking about material consciousness as a form of consciousness that I can understand as one, or 
maybe just like a kind of randomness that works. Uh, I feel like this is this has been a good teacher to me. This is a something called a hunger cloth uh, made by medieval nuns in France. This is a drawing of uh, or a petroglyph of the supernova that exploded in 1054. Um, so what I find so spectacular about it is one the artist's hand, so this relationship between the cosmos and the maker. Um, so this is the moon while it's right on the horizon. And so this was recorded, it's pretty amazing, like in, uh, it was recorded in China, it was recorded in, um, I think, uh, Egypt, and, and uh, this is in north uh, western New Mexico in Chaco Canyon. And um, so it's seen really around the globe, but the second thing that I find really spectacular is, and that star is the supernova, probably, that this is looking up uh, into an overhang, and then whatever the artist did was, and then where this is, it's um, vertical. So what that spiral is, is the sun. And so it's, it's meant to indicate that the sun is below the horizon, which I think is a really phenomenal use of space. Um, this is a close-up of a Parmigiano drawing, um, and the drawing's great, but I, I really liked the, the use that it had been folded up and hung up and, and worked on so much, and so really what the surface was and the quality of the image that I was getting was time and touch and care and travel. Um, this is a painting of minnows by uh, Zhou Dongxing uh, in the Yuan Dynasty in China. And in it, there's an inscription, which I'd love to read, which is, not being fish, how do we know their happiness? But we may express our feelings in our painting. In order to probe the subtleties of the ordinary, we must describe the indescribable. I like little dishes that hold water, um, either man-made or natural. This one is uh, from a pre-Aztec um, group outside of Mexico City. I like the fluidity of the water and then the, the seeming hardness of the stone, but then knowing that the water is in fact changing the stone. Um, that's a tree, but I think it does the same thing. And then this is a Hellenistic sculpture of a, of a griever, a woman um, whose veil is only covering half her face. And it, it's, it's, um, its sensitivity is amazing, but I, I think a lot of that comes from how the artist chose the stone, that it's, it feels like maybe that was as important uh, as the carving itself. A few weeks ago, I visited the Princeton University Art Gallery. Upon entering the room that houses their contemporary collection, amidst a beautiful Anne Reinhardt and a towering Judd, my heart was drawn like a magnet to a minuscule pink square that from far away was nothing but a color. It was, of course, an Agnes Martin print called Praise, a light pink square with several pairs of vertical lines stretching upwards. What draws us to an object or an artwork? What pulls us across a long gallery past massive expressionistic sculptures and paintings and Roman figures to fall weak at the knees at what is really only a couple of pencil marks on a piece of paper? How can seeing a fragment of Sappho, which is, for all intents and purposes, just a few words I've heard a million times before, create a shift in how I understand love? This is either a question of matter or a question of spirit. But I think what I'm trying to get at is that without saying it directly, for me, the material and the spiritual are not separate subjects. And it's only recently that they've been treated as such. 
I'm inclined to believe that the separation is more indicative of a culturally and geographically specific worldview rather than a reflection of an inherent state of difference. It's fascinating, although at times quite devastating, to read about the endless trials on animated or holy matter in medieval Europe, for example, or to look at images of Shinto shrines in Japan in which objects some would call inanimate can possess a level of energetic agency that transcends the limits of my education. The botanist Robin Kimmerer reminds us quite beautifully that there aren't really any scientific studies emerging which reveal that the world is actually dumber than we thought. Rather, so many suggest the opposite, that our universe is more coherent and magnificent than we ever imagined, and that our understanding of consciousness has been at times unspeakably limited. How can I feel a sense of belonging to my world? How can I experience intimacy, co-becoming with the matter I've been conditioned to see other than, than mine? How can I access the memories of emergence? Connectivity between myself and physical stuff is how I understand and experience the world to be sacred. Prayer, of course, can be many things for so many people, but for me, it is setting an intention to get close to being. I think, though, that the dissolution I've been talking about is a rare feeling, or at least one that remains beyond my grasp. Because I've never experienced this kind of collapse of boundaries, um, it becomes yet again an art question, an unanswerable pursuit that brings me to my work. I'd like to start wrapping up by telling you about an image that I've been thinking about. Chaco Canyon, the same site as the as supernova explosion. In northwestern New Mexico is the site of an ancient city of ruling elite, ancestors to the contemporary pueblos throughout the southwest. Although this site is extraordinary for many reasons, what draws me to it is the prevalence of archaeoastronomical alignments, both through architecture and through petroglyphs. Some buildings, for example, appear to indicate where on the horizon the sun will rise on a particular date, marking the change of the seasons. In combination with the carefully placed man-made structures, the horizon line can become a kind of calendar. Or perhaps you've heard of the sun dagger, a spiral covered by three slabs of stone so perfectly placed that at noon on the solstice, a sliver of light passes directly through the center of the spiral. What has been on my mind is a petroglyph a bit farther away, and at first glance not nearly as elaborate as the other images in the canyon. What I've been thinking about is a simple spiral right below a level slab of stone, only big enough to hold one body. A watcher who sits on the platform can gaze perhaps five miles into the distance onto a very prominent butte, and if an observer were to sit above the spiral every morning watching for sunrise, he or she would see the sun slowly move day by day across the landscape as it rises one, in one morning, the date of the winter solstice, directly from the butte. The drawn spiral below becomes the mark that places the body into a direct line with the landscape and then the cosmos. In our specialized world, it sounds ridiculous and perhaps even arrogant to wish for one's work to have a similar capacity to stretch beyond the human, between the human and the cosmic scale, to enact a conversation with vastness. At my very first critique at grad school, one of the visiting critics said, it's not like you can make work about the whole universe. She's most likely right, but on the other hand, what else is there? I like work that takes on this kind of impossibility. But most importantly, I think art is one of the only fields we have that allows both tremendous belief and long shot possibility to be taken really seriously. Where else in our world can we open up a space for that which we feel and have not yet found proof, or ideas for which we sense a glimmer of understanding and haven't had the language to explain? And as far out and embryonic as my ideas may be, I feel held up and supported by the artists whom, whom I love the artist for whom, after Saison again, my heart quickens. The artist who I never knew um, and who never knew I would exist, but helped me so much anyway. 
I think of Rilke, who writes in his book of hours, I live my life in widening circles that reach out across the world. I may not complete this last one, but I give myself to it. Or Lorca, each art has roots that unite at the point from which, the fl which flow the dark sounds of Manuel Torre, the ultimate matter. Dark sounds behind which in tender intimacy exist volcanoes, ants, zephyrs, and the vast night pressing its waste against the Milky Way. And I think of the very last line from Leslie Silko's great novel Ceremony, just a single word filling us with beauty as we prepare to fall into the turn of things again. Sunrise. Thank you. I don't know if anybody has any questions. Or... The landscape chats were hosted in Peru. Um, the first ones were taken uh, while driving um, at dawn, and then uh, these ones. Uh, I received a travel grant to document uh, archaeoastronomical sites. Um, and I went to Bolivia, Peru, and Mexico. And uh, this was in a cave outside of Cusco. And um, on the solstice, uh, the cave floods with light and this stacked triangle, which is a symbol of Pachamama, the earth, uh, emerges. And then the other ones were, um, yeah, from this, those travels. <laughs> Uh, I wondered if you could say something more about the um, uh, second layer in your larger works that um, you showed. You talked a lot about the wool and so forth, but um, yeah, what is it? Um, it's more than just a support, I assume. Yeah, um, to me, it, it. I mean, in these pieces. Um, I'm going to go back to that first one. Um, a lot of it comes from color. The, the wool pieces, it's hard to see in these photos, but are, are beaten so that they're so thin um, that the color they pick up on is on the pieces behind. Um, so that's a big part of it. And the middle layer is also transparent. So it's a, it's a particular quality of light. I think that's interesting to me. Um, the paper also, because it's folded, becomes like lines stretching in. Um, something that I've been, been uh, thinking about and um, I wouldn't say struggling with, but definitely it will be a question that I continue is I'm interested in fragments and I'm interested in things that um, aren't at first glance necessarily uh, filled with enough structure to take a second look. Um, and, and Sappho's fragments, poems, become really big inspirations for me because they are just words, but because of the translation and because of the, the history, I am able to read them and really be, be moved. Um, but to get back to my work, uh, the question of how do I, I give these these pieces which have this softness, a enough grounding that they, they um, are able to exist within a structure that allows people to look at them. And um, one of the things is just lines, uh, lines pointing in. Um, so I think, yeah, thank you for asking about the middle there. The com it's a combination of light and then the folds creating uh, marks of drawing moving inwards. Yes? I wanted to say your prose has a lot of depth. Thank you. And I wanted to ask you, what's your working style? Do you work like when you start, you just stay at it, or you have boundaries? <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, 
my biggest Achilles heel is definitely like overworking. Like I, I get really obsessed and just stay in the studio forever. So a, a lot of it, and and I think um, that becomes a problem because I think that there's a, a particular quietness that is in a lot of the work that I showed you that I aim for. And I think when you're tired, even if you're really excited, that it, that's a harder emotion to express. So. My studio ends up being, I only have one piece that I'm working on at a time up, and I don't even have books unless they're the books that I'm thinking about directly. Um, and I'm pretty vigilant about keeping a strict schedule, and then, you know, when the day's done, like, go home and make dinner, like, feed yourself. And uh, as, as foreign as that feels, it's, I think it makes my work better. <laughs> and materially, um, you should see me after a day in the studio. I have like a uh, pigment in my nostrils. <laughs> I don't know. It's so I don't. I don't feel like I do this, but somehow I've managed to like roll around in everything. Thank you. You're a weaver. Are, are some of the works by Native American uh, in New Mexico, or are you purchasing these things and then beating them and dyeing them with natural dyes? Uh, they're all woven by me, um, and most of these are on a, uh, a harness loom, um, and that, that's again for the linearity, uh, the quality of linearity, although the current works, which I would love to, to show you sometime, um, are uh, on a tapestry loom which allows the, the curves to come in and they become more materially complex. Um, I, I see that again as a kind of drawing. Yes? I wondered if you would comment a little bit more about when you were speaking about kissing a piece of your work. Because <laughs> earlier you had said that there was an artist who had a bite mark out of the art. Yeah. It, it kind of indicated you to consuming of it. So when you kiss your work, is it just simply because you like it? you're drawn to it, or it's a manifestation of yourself, or it also shows a connection between you and other matter. I love that you're asking that, and I think it's all, all of those things, but I think mostly, like I said, that I'm, I'm trying to really love, fall in love with my work and to try and treat love as intellectually as, um, as maybe disinterest or apathy. Um, but it's not easy to love my work, and it's, I feel bad even saying that, it's like a big secret, but, um, you know, because it's all of you, and, and, and it's hard to love all of yourself, and to, to see all of yourself is, is really scary. Um, so when you, you put up a work, and, and you see it all, and, and when, I, when I think about myself, I think like, oh, I, there's a million things I could improve on, and, and the work, um, you know, I hope to be doing this my whole life, so so I, I just see it expanding. And so the kissing my work is is more like <coughs> saying that even though it's hard, and even though this is more scary than being apathetic or or down on it, that like I'm trying to make an effort, I guess. And it's just a, it's a, like a literal act that I can think of that expresses care. Um, I think it's a little less like the man bites painting that painting with a bite taken out of it. I think. If, I think there's an aggression that I hope the kiss doesn't have, but you know, like that's not always true in in history. So, do you, um, in learning to love your work or going through this process and the psychology of that? I mean, have you encountered um, the, you know, like you said, it's hard to love it, but have you encountered the? I guess with love you have moments of frustration and even maybe resentment and you know all of those the 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 yin and yang of having any kind of relationship you have to have both. I mean how has that played in your experience of loving your work? Um Yeah, I think that's a really good point. Um I think when I eat, when I love with the people that I love or the the um, it doesn't mean I'm, I don't get irritated or frustrated or, or like, yeah, really driven to a, a point of emotion. Um, but that the people that I love, like, 
I love them uncritically, that I, I might not like their haircut, but I will love them um, to the end of the earth. And I guess that kind of love that, and, and it gets um, so similar to what you said, but I think it gets more to this idea that, that maybe it's just me picking up on this, but that if one loves one's work, one cannot be as critical as necessary to improve it. And that maybe is what I'm more interested in combating, that I can have a critical relationship with my work, I can make it better, I can push myself just as hard as if I love my work as if I felt contentious with it. Um, and it's a hypothesis. I, I um, yeah, um, I think, um, do you guys know Thich Nhat Hanh? Yes. <laughs> I think he's so interesting because I, I think he's actually like, um, his writing is so complex and it, it's, to do what he suggests is like incredibly profound and, and would be a total revolution of a life, but the way he says it is with so much kindness and, um, I will never in a million lifetimes get to where he is, but to take that as kind of a model, um, that the two can coexist, is, is how I'd like to, to learn to make my work. Thank you. Thank you all. Thanks for coming. <laughs>